I want to be at freedom of the Holy Spirit to tell you something we need to talk about today. A very uncomfortable reality. That's what I want to talk about. I said a very uncomfortable reality. What I'm going to talk to you about today is something that is a reality, first of all. A truth. Something that we can't get beyond. There's nothing we can do about it. It's just a fact. It's a reality. And the thing about this reality, in some ways it's okay, but even in my life, more so, it's an uncomfortable reality. And you'll understand once I explain it a little bit more, but this is an uncomfortable reality that every human being has to face, and most people are going to find it more uncomfortable than they will comfortable. And even, like I said, for me, I'm not comfortable with the, out, the reality of it, but it's just the way it is. Sometimes things are just the way it is. You can't change it. And I've defined it as very uncomfortable because once you hear it, you're going to become a little bit uncomfortable and to some extent almost very uncomfortable. And when I think about it, the more I think about it, the more very uncomfortable it is. But let's look at this for a moment, and I'm going to go, and, and this is going to be the message actually taught probably in two verses of Scripture, and a third verse, and then I'm going to build on that, and I'm going to give you the support where I go and I get all this information I have, but you're going to be able to figure this out. It's going to make good sense to you. But to various degrees, some of you will like you might, no, you're not going to like it. Maybe somebody will. But I just wish it weren't so. And sometimes I do wish it were so. But most of the time, I guess you just have to accept it. You'll hear it. You'll hear it in a minute. In Genesis, the third chapter, and the eighth verse, we have a very familiar scripture. We've dealt with it time and time again. And some of you say, I've been over this before. Yes, you have. And it's still in the Bible. It ain't gone nowhere. And it's still going to be there. So if it's still there, it must be still there for a reason. And the Lord gave me a, another revelation of looking at this thing. And as, as I continue to go over and over things again, God continues to speak to me more and more. And it's this uncomfortable reality that we're going to look at right here. And it says, now you know the story before this this is Adam and Eve, and, and this is after they have partaken of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I like to reverse that, the tree of knowledge of evil and good. They have partaken of that fruit, and God told them not to do it. And the Bible says their eyes were open, were open and they knew they were naked. And here in this verse, they said, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I want that last phrase to kind of echo in your minds that Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Just that first part of it I want to look at and then I'm going to break it down and look at the second part. They hid themselves. Now, why did they hide themselves? They hid themselves because they had not done what God told them to do. He told them, do not eat of this tree, and they did, and you know it. And as a result, they recognized that they had done wrong. And in their doing wrong, they heard the voice of God walking in the cool of the day. You see, God can walk around. In the cool of the day, God can walk wherever he goes. He walks comfortably because he's God. And as he was walking in the area where he normally walked, in the comfort of the Garden of Eden, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking. And the Bible says they hid themselves. What did they do? Say it to me. What did I just tell you? They did what? Why? They had done wrong. Why? Because 
They knew God was coming. Now, God had created them. How could they figure that they can eat of this tree and God not know? How are they hiding when he's God? And they hid themselves. It's something that doesn't work in our mind how you and I think we can hide from God. We can't hide from God. And the Bible says they did. They did a folly, a foolish, a, 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 a vain thing. They hid from him. They hid from what? They hid, the Bible says, they hid from the presence of God. What does that mean? They didn't want to be in the presence of God because they knew God was going to hold them accountable for what they'd done. What did they do? They heard God. They didn't want to be in his presence. You got that? Now, this is the facts of life, that this is what Adam and Eve did. They did not want to be in the presence of God. You see that in the Bible there. And then the stupidity of it is that they hid themselves, the Bible said, among the trees of the garden. We are doing the same thing today, people. We are hiding from the presence of God, not among the trees of the garden, but among the trees of the world, among the things of the world. Many of us don't want to be in the presence of God because if we come in the presence of God, God will reveal what we've done wrong. And so we hide out among the things of the world. Might be our job. Some of us don't want to come into the presence of the Lord in the sanctuary where the saints of God are because we are using the trees of the world, our job, our car, our house, our hobbies, our things. We are hiding from God's presence. You say, wait a minute, you're trying to talk about coming to church. I ain't got to come to church to be in the presence of the Lord. Let me tell you something. Jesus said something a little bit different than that. He said, wherever two or more gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So it appears to me that when we've gathered in this room, guiding light, every one of us being together brings the presence of the Lord with us. And let me tell you something. You are here today, and because you are here, you help multiply the presence of God by your being here. One person can be by themselves, and yes, Lord can be with them, but one can put a thousand to flight, two put ten thousand. What God has put us together is that we learn that when we're together, we can do powerful things when we're unified. The devil doesn't want us to be unified and in a house like this because the presence of the Lord is magnified by all of us being together. But there are people who don't come to church on a regular basis. I want you to understand where is God's presence. Oh yes, his, his glory fills the earth, but God has established his church to be the place of his truth. He has established that in this gathering today, he is in the midst of us. His presence is with us. And I'm going to say to you that those people that have chosen, they don't want to be in a church. They don't want to be part of a fellowship. They are hiding from the presence of God. Come on, tell me where I'm wrong on the issue. Did he not say two or more gathered in my name? And then he said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. God expects you to be in church. Now, this is not the uncomfortable reality I'm talking about. I'm just telling you the truth that you're doing the right thing, God, and like being here this morning. I praise God for it. You're supposed to be here because he told us to be together, to be one as I and the Father are one. We are to be here. The presence of the Lord is in this house. And when people decide they don't want to come to the house of the Lord, they are saying, I don't want to be in the presence of God. Well, I'm not really saying that. I just don't believe in organized religion. I just don't believe I have to go to a church to do that. No, you know, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but what God said was say not the assembly of yourself. God said that come together as one, and by your love, you'll prove that you're my disciples. I don't care what you believe. Amen. I want you to tell you, I want you to know something. I don't get upset when you act stupid. You can act as stupid as you want to. You can ignore God. I'm not going to get upset. I don't get mad. We can be different on that, but I know what God said. As long as I know what God said, I'm going to stay with God. Amen. And I ain't got to fight you because you don't want to come to church. You don't want to be in the presence of God. But I want you to see something. Adam and Eve, Adam and his 
wife hid from the presence of the Lord God among the trees. They made an excuse. And when God said, where are you, Adam? He said, oh, I was naked, so I was afraid, so I hid. And here's the second verse I want us to look at. Because Adam and Eve chose not to be in the presence of God. In verse 24, God said, okay, you don't want to be with me? He said, verse 24, so he drove out the man. I want you to understand that you are making a choice by the way you live your life today. If you want to be with God, you can be with him. If you don't want to be with him, God can fix it so you ain't got to be in his presence. What he did with Adam and Eve is what he is doing with people today. He's giving them a choice as to whether they want to be in his presence or not. And the Bible say he drove them out. Why you drive them out, Lord? Because they said they didn't want to be in my presence by their actions. And you got to understand that God is watching the way you act, people, not only what you are saying. You don't want to be in his presence? God's going to tell you one day, you ain't got to be in my presence. And he drove out the man and his wife. He drove them out of his presence, not because he wanted to, but because they didn't want to be with him. He said, well, Bishop, where you get that from? What that verse say a minute ago, a verse eight? They hid from the presence. They hid, they didn't want to be with God. Don't you see that? Don't you see that? And I want you to see it in such a way that you've got to be careful that some of the actions that you take are showing you don't want to be with God. And don't let God take it out of your hands. You ain't got to sing in no choir. You ain't got to serve in the church. You ain't got to do nothing for the glory of God. You don't want to do. But the uncomfortable reality is that when they hid, they couldn't hide because the Lord God was walking in the garden and God, all the things that he is, the most uncomfortable thing about Almighty God is that he's a judge. He's a judge of all the earth. And what makes it worse, he's a righteous judge. Because how do we know this? Because when Adam and Eve hid, he said, Adam, where are you? And Adam came out and he said, I was afraid. He said, what have you done? And he judged them. God's a judge. That's the terrible thing. That's the most uncomfortable thing. God judged Adam and Eve because of their actions of hiding. And he sentenced them. He judged them. And he's going to judge us too. That's the uncomfortable thing. You know, we don't mind talking about how much God loves us and how wonderful he is. Oh, God this, God this. But you got to remember one thing. Fundamentally, above all, God in this, this third chapter here shows us of all the wonderful things that he's done, he's still a judge. He's a righteous judge. And he judges the works of every human being. He judged Adam and Eve. And he said to Adam, have you listened to your wife, who I told you that not to eat of this tree and you did it? He said, as a result of it. Now, here's your sentence. The earth is going to produce, but it's going to produce by the sweat of your brow. And to the woman, he passed judgment on her. He said, now here's what's going to happen. You're going to have pain in childbirth. And various other things he said to her. And to the serpent, he said, then. why did he do that? Because he's a judge. God's a judge. He's a judge. He's a judge. Get it in your mind. And then what he did, he said, okay, now I looked at you, tried to hide. You didn't want to be in my presence. So get out. So I want to caution everybody in this room. Your attitude actually shows your desire to want to be with God. Be very careful that you are not going to cause God to believe you don't want to be with him by the way you acting around his people. Because if his presence is in the midst of two or three or more of us, when I don't want to be in the house of the Lord here on earth, what about God when he finally judges me? 
and he decides, you didn't want to be in my house. You didn't want to hear my word. You didn't want to praise my name. Although you might have called yourself a Christian, your works show something other than you being truly one who loves me with all your heart. You know what Jesus said? He said there's going to be a lot of folk in that day they're going to think they say, and they're going to come around, and when I said, he said, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. And he said, then I'm going to also tell the thing, when I was sick, where were you? When I was in prison, where, where were you? When I needed your help, where were you? Well, Lord, I was hiding among my job. I was hiding at the game. I was hiding at the office. I was hiding in, in my hobbies. Where were you when I was looking for you to be in my presence? Where were you? Well, Lord, I, 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 I went on Christmas and, and I went on Easter. But I want you to understand God's a righteous judge for some of those of you that show up on Christmas and Easter. You're not in here right now because it's not either one of those days. But let me do this. There are those that make church every other Sunday. And they're, they're going to say, look, look, okay, I came in your presence every other Sunday. Or I at least made it once a month. And you know what? That's good, too, because God's going to judge. And he's going to look at you and he's going to say, okay, well, I'm going to give you one once a month blessings then. I'm going to give you a Christmas and Easter blessing. But since there ain't no Christmas and Easter in the hereafter, I guess you don't get nothing. I don't know what God's going to do, but I'll tell you this. He's a judge. He's a righteous judge. And here's what I want everyone to understand. Adam and Eve chose to hide themselves from the presence of the Lord. And because of their own choice, it wasn't God that did this maliciously to them. They chose to hide. And as a result, he banished them from the Garden of Eden. So let me give you this fundamental truth here. God has given everyone a life to live for them to choose by their actions how they wish to spend their eternity, with or without him. Think about what the Lord gave me to give to you. He's given you this life, this very moment, these very few precious moments that you have in your life for you to choose by your actions. Now, your actions. What did God say? He said, let your light shine your light, and most of us say, yeah, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. So that men might see your good what? Works. I hate to tell some of y'all, it just ain't good enough to just show up in his presence and sit down. Because he's going to say, he's, wait until I show you the scriptures where he says he judges every man according to their works. Well, I ain't got to work to get saved. No, you don't. But to get blessed... You got to work. You don't have to get the work to get saved because salvation is free. But wait until I show you. See, God got to judge something. So you got to first of all realize he's a judge and he ain't just judging you for nothing. If you accept you ain't got nothing. But he has given everyone a life for them to choose by their actions, to let their good works be seen so that God can receive the glory. And if you ain't done no work, how is he going to judge the work you ain't done? You're deciding how you're going to spend your eternity, with or without him. And I'm sorry to say, Jesus said, there are many that call on my name that ain't going to make it in. You know why? Because their works don't show it. Oh, you might ask me, well, Bishop, well, uh, why work's so important? Let me tell you something. I love the Lord, and I love you too. And the way I show it is by what I do every Sunday, every Wednesday, and every day of the week by the works that I do to show you how much I love you. What good is a husband or a wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend if they say, I love you? But they don't never do nothing for your good. Is that love? I mean, who wants a kind of love like that? I love you, but they're not doing nothing for you. Do you not realize that there are people all over this world that proclaim that they love the Lord and don't lift up a finger to do a thing for him or for his kingdom? It's a lot of folk like that. And remember 
He's a judge. But you still may not like the idea. I got proof he's a judge. Don't ever challenge me to think I ain't got nothing to back up what I talk about. I'm just dealing with two scriptures right now. Because I'm just giving you the facts of the matter. He's a judge, and he's going to judge your works, whether you got them or not. You know what? But I'm going to tell you this. If you ain't got no works, he's going to judge your ain't got. Because you got some works. By not working, you already have a work of not working. And what do the works show? They show the first commandment, the greatest commandment, to love the Lord with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. What strength? But works. My works reflect the attitude of my heart. If you love somebody, you show it in some way. If your heart is with a thing, you're going to do it. Did Alabama win yesterday? Okay. Did Auburn win yesterday? If that's your team, you already know that they won. You've already paid attention to how they did, if that's your team, because you love your team. You check up on your team. Well, if God is your God, you need to find out what your God is doing. You know, some of you will give to your alma mater. And you'll give to that because that was a school you went to. Uh, some of you will give to your boyfriend, your girlfriend. Some of you, you do all, it's by your works you show what's in your heart. For out of the heart does the mouth speak. And the mouth speaks and says things. God is judging your works in order to determine the quality of your heart towards him. Let me tell you something. If I truly love the Lord, then I'm going to do a lot of things for him because I truly love him. The work that I do for the Lord reveals how much I truly love him. The work I do for my wife or for you or for anybody, that reveals what's the content of the heart. If you say you love somebody, you ain't doing nothing for them, you ain't got much love for them. So when God judges the works, I want you to realize he's looking at the works to see what's really on the inside. Because it's a lot to say, I love you and not do nothing. Anybody can do that. But a person that he says, for the works sake, Jesus said, if you don't believe in me for what I say, believe because of the works. Because of the works are the things that prove who you really are. To say you love the Lord, you can't come to church, but at Christmas and Easter, you ain't got no love for God. To say you love the Lord, and I have to put this point on you too, if you say you love the Lord and you can't do nothing for him, that ain't much of a love. See if your husband or your wife would appreciate a love like that. Well, I love you, but I'm not going to kiss you. I love you, but I'm not going to cook you no dinner. I love you, but I'm not going to provide a house for you. I love you, but I'm not going to go to job. I'm going to sit here and play video games. I love you. But the bills got to be paid. I love you, but you can carry the garbage out yourself. I love you, and I ain't got to do nothing because I love you. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? What kind of love is that? But that's the kind of love that we want to do for God. I love you, and I'll come and sit and hear your word, but don't expect me to do nothing. But, 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 but let me just go ahead, because I'm speaking on works, to prove to you that, first of all, you're going to have to, if you expect, God is a judge, and he's going to judge some works. And if you got them, you're going to get judged. If you ain't got them, you're going to get judged. Hebrews 9.27, here comes the third scripture. I told you there were three. And then after the three, I got a ton to roll after that to prove everything I'm saying to you right here. <laughs> For anybody not believing and knowing, I know what I'm talking about. I don't play. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 27. And it is appointed for men to die once. Hey, y'all. Another uncomfortable reality is that 100 years from now, most of us are going to be dead. But then, after this, comes the what? God has given us a life to live 
for us to choose how we want to spend eternity. He is going to judge the way we live this life. If we are like Adam and Eve, hiding from his presence, he will banish us from his presence. If, unlike Adam and Eve, we are seeking, even when we've done wrong, to confess it and come before him and throw ourselves at his feet, then he will take us into his kingdom. That's a choice we have to make. It's a very uncomfortable reality, but our God is a righteous judge. Every human being will undergo a judgment regarding the works that they have done in this life. And now I'm going to prove that, that God judges every human being, and no one escapes God's judgment. Nobody escapes God's judgment. He did it in the beginning, and what he does in the beginning, because he's the same, he did it in the beginning, he's going to do it in the end. Because he is Alpha and Omega. God's going to judge the unrighteous, and that's something that makes us happy. We want all them mean, hateful folk that mistreated us to get a judgment, don't we? Them folk that talked about us, lied on us. God going to get you. Hallelujah. We love that idea. Folk that mistreated us and done us wrong, talked about us, put our name all out in the gut and everything. God need to get them. Can I get an amen on that? When folk despitefully misuse you, mistreat you, when they hurt you, just being mean to you. We want God to get them. Is that not an amen? We want all the folks, like when the man went up here, he killed all them folk in Las Vegas, all these folks shooting folk. We want that. Shoot our son. We want God to get him. We, jail ain't enough for him. Hell is where we want him going. God's going to judge the unrighteous, and we're satisfied with that. But there's an unfortunate problem, too. You need to know God's going to judge the righteous, and that means Christians. Christians got a judgment coming, too. A little bit different than the unrighteous, but there's a judgment coming. Because God is a righteous judge. He judges everyone. Now, I'm going to prove all of this. Let me give you some examples that God is a judge. The first one I just gave you was Adam and Eve. God judged Adam and Eve, and he sends them, put them out of the garden. God judged the people in Noah's day. And those people that were in Noah's day, what did he do to them? He drowned all them. God? Kill all these folks? He killed, he destroyed the whole world at that time. Who you think you are? Because you don't believe he judges. He judged all of them. There were probably some folk at that time say, God don't do that. God ain't going to kill all of us. They did. God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. Love. God can't be against love. What do you think he did to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were loving on themselves, men loving men, women, women loving women. And what did God say? He rained down fire from, the, from heaven. Oh, my goodness. What's wrong with love? You should be able to love whoever you want to. Go ask God. God created a male and female. God had a plan of how they're supposed to love one another. And there's certain ways a man ought not love on a man. There's certain ways a woman ought not be loving on a woman. You need to understand what I'm saying. We're supposed to love one another. And don't think you're doing good when you're sitting up saying, well, God told me to love my brother. I'm loving him the way I love a woman. You're wrong. That ain't what God said. But you better understand something. Do what you want to do. Ain't nobody going to get mad with you. You can choose whatever life you want. Life is choice-driven. You live and die by the choices you make. But understand this, you're still going to be judged by God. And what God says is what's going to matter. So I don't get upset. He judged Sodom and Gomorrah, rained down fire from heaven. God judged Egypt. Why? Because he kept messing with his people. He sent ten plagues down upon them, and he destroyed the army of Pharaoh. God judged his own people. For those of you that don't believe that his own people get judged, remember when they worshipped that golden calf? God killed a bunch of them. Judge them and say, that's wrong. So don't believe he doesn't judge his own folk. And then you remember when Achan, Achan went over there in, in, in Jericho. He took that thing over there and God said, don't mess with it. Here's a terrible thing, a very uncomfortable reality, is that not only did God judge Achan, got his wife, got his children, got, got his, his sheep, got his cattle, his tent, and I hate to think about it, he probably got his cat too. 
and they stoned all of them. I mean, I can understand Achan. He stole the stuff. Maybe his wife knew he stole it. And maybe the kids knew it. I can understand. Kill them. But the cat? And then God, you know, some of you all might say, well, you know, that's Old Testament. Well, there was a man named Ananias and a woman named Sapphira. And this in the New Testament. And they were bringing the money to the church. And what happened, they had conspired to lie about what they were bringing in. And they came up there, Ananias came up and he said, Peter said, is that all of it? He said, yeah, that's it. And he said, how can you lie before the Holy Spirit? And God judged them right there, and he died right there. And then a little while later, they brought his wife in, you know, husband and wife of one. And uh, uh, Peter said, did you sell this property for such and such, and you gave it to, all of it to the church? Yeah, we did. She, he said, how can you put your mouth to say that? We just carried your husband out and buried him. And now the folk just coming back in, they're going to have to carry you out. And she judged. He, she was judged by God right there and died right on the spot. God judged the New Testament saints. God judged them in Corinth when he said, now let me tell you something. Here's the reason why some of y'all are weak, some of y'all are sick, and some of y'all have fallen asleep. Because you have disrespected my communion table, and you have not regarded properly the body of Christ. And for that reason, I'm judging some of you, you sick because of this. Some of you all are going to pass away because you have not respected my communion table. You have not respected the body of Christ. You had something you were supposed to do to help the body of Christ, but you disrespected my body, and you kept your part out of it. I don't know. I don't know how you do. I'm just telling you some of the stuff you need to be careful about. Because there's some of you all sitting out there, and you know you got something. You can bless the kingdom of God with it, but you hiding it. Just like Ananias and Sapphira hid part of what they had, kept it for themselves. Some of you are keeping your gifts for yourself when you got something you can do for the kingdom of God, but you don't want to be in the presence of God. Don't let God judge you. The Bible also tells us if we would rightly discern the body of Christ and judge ourselves, we wouldn't come under judgment. I know some of you are getting upset by what I'm talking about, but I got to tell you the truth because I don't want If you're going to hell, you know why you're going. I want you to know why you're going. That's the reason I'm going to tell you this stuff. It's an uncomfortable reality, but God says it all throughout Scripture. In Ecclesiastes 12, 14, here's what the Scripture tells us. For God will bring every work in the judgment. It didn't say the, righteous, the unrighteous only because when I start teaching on the, the Christians and the judgment that we're going to have, Paul said we all got to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Everybody got to give it a, a, an account for every work that we've done. And I'm going to let some of you Christians be concerned for a moment while I do this, and I'll tell you about yours in a minute. But I want everybody to be afraid for a moment, very afraid, so you know that some of you sitting out there might be on your way to hell and you don't realize it. You're sitting up smiling, but not in God and light, church. When you go into hell, you know you're on your way. Because I'm going to reveal all the truth to you. If you don't want to be in the presence of God, you're already showing it by the way you're treating his church. Because his church is his body. And if you're going to mistreat the body of Christ, that's what Paul was judging the Corinthians about. You have not shown the right attitude towards my church. So he says this, for God will bring every work into judgment. And here's a terrible thing. Another uncomfortable stuff. Baby, what we do in private. Every secret thing. Shh, don't tell nobody. God listening when you whispering. He ain't no respecter of your privacy. God don't give nobody privacy. He said he'll bring every work in the judgment, including every secret thing. You got a secret? God know about it. Yeah, help us, Jesus. You know, can you keep a secret, God? 
No. Because of the day of judgment, I'm going to call it out. What did Adam and Eve try to do? They hid. And what did God do? He called them out. So everything we hide, God going to call out. You go back to Genesis and find that out. So who you think you're fooling? The problem is God is a judge. He going to judge us. He going to judge what we have done. Every work. Now notice this, whether good or evil, that's whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian. All of us get judged. The question is, and this one thing bothers me, what's uncomfortable about it, I don't feel like I've done enough yet. I want to keep living so I can do more. Why do I work as hard as I do with you all? Why am I so long-winded? Because I want to make sure I'm giving all I got. We can live our lives any way we want to, y'all. God has given us freedom of choice. We can do whatever we doggone well want to do. We can ignore him or we can serve him. But in the final analysis, God going to judge us either way. Ignore him if you want to. He's still going to call you out. Serve him. He's going to call you out. Now, let me, let me help you feel a little bit better about it. So I go to the point of the Christians, those of you that are truly Christians. He's going to judge your work, not to condemn you, but to appreciate you. He judges your work to give you a reward. For those that have not accepted Jesus, he judges you in order to determine your eternal destination. You didn't accept Jesus, you didn't want to be in his presence, so he's going to ban you from him. But those that have accepted Jesus, the works are not getting you saved. You're already saved by your confession by Christ. But your works determine what your blessings are going to be. Now, I'll say that. I'm going to say it again. That's so those of you that, that want to be at peace, I hope I said it, but I will say it again and get it better. But I'm going to go ahead about this life being choice-driven. In Ecclesiastes 11, in verse 9, look right here. Here's your choice. Rejoice, O young man, for the young folk in this room. Rejoice in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart. Do whatever you want to do. And in the sight of your eyes, do whatever you want to do. What's in your heart, what's in the sight of your eyes. But know this. After all you done done, that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. I want you to look at that. That's clearly stating to you and to me, all of us, while we have this life, we can do whatever we want to do. Look at it. Let your heart cheer you. Go party. Go have a good time. Enjoy the game. Enjoy the movies. Walk in the ways of your heart. Do whatever you want to do. And in the, in, your, in the sight of your eyes, what? Okay, I saw this. I had to do it. I had to go to Las Vegas. I had to go. I, I've, been to, I've been here. I've been there. I've been all. I've been to Paris. I've been to Rome. I've been all over the world. I've been to London. I've been here. Do whatever you want. But know this. Do you see the rest of the story? Be happy. Be young. Be foolish. Do whatever you want to do. But know this. Do whatever. Have, go to the party. Go to the carnival. Go to the club. Hang out. Go to the jip joint. Get drunk. Be drunk then Scooter Brown. Do whatever. Smoke. Do whatever. But know this. Cuss. Lie. Steal. Cheat. Rob, but know this. Do whatever your heart wants you to do. But the Bible says, but know this. Cuss people out. Roll your eyes at folks. Talk about people behind their back. Get in the choir and start complaining about other folks. She can't sing. She ain't this. She ain't that. Be on the ushers and talk about this. She come with herself. Look at her with her old fat self. You know, talk about people all you want, but know this. You hear what I'm saying? You ain't got to come to no church, but know this. You ain't got to love everybody, but know this. You ain't got to treat people right, but know this. You hear what I'm saying? You ain't got to love everybody, but know this. You ain't got to serve, but know this. What else? Whatever you fill in the blank. You can go out there and you're going to praise that team. 
you go out there and go, woo, yeah. And then when God's time to be praised, that's all right. But know this. You hear what I'm saying? I'm trying to get the message across. You can be out there in that audience and you can sing and you talking about them. They ain't singing. Well, why don't you get up here and sing? Let me tell you something. Sit out there on your talent, but know this. I don't want to write on the tithe sheet that this is a tithe because it ain't really the tithe. That's okay. Don't nobody know. But know this. God, who is the righteous judge, notice what he said. He will bring you into judgment for what you have done. This is the uncomfortable thing. When I look back over my life and think about some of the stuff that I've done, <laughs> but you know one thing, I can do this. By the grace of God, See, I know that all that stuff that I did that was low down and dirty and that was wrong because I accepted Jesus. That has been washed away by the blood of the Lamb. And I have been cleansed of all unrighteousness. But when I was sitting up at home and could go to church and didn't go, when I could have said a little, little kind word to somebody and didn't do it. When I could have prayed a prayer for somebody, when I could have touched and agreed, when I could have just done a little something to help the ministry go forward. All those works are works I could have done and because I didn't do them, you'll find out later on that we'll be judged and for the stuff we did not do we'll lose a reward for it. Now, you don't see all that just yet, but you know, if I told you, I'm giving you a heads up. You better believe. I'm going to prove it. I ain't proving it this week, but I'm going to prove it next week. So if you don't want to hear it, be cheerful. Stay away. Don't come back. Do whatever your heart wants you to do. But know this. Whether you know it or not, God is going to bring in the judgment every work. Yeah. Yeah. And to him who knows what's right to do and does not do it, he says, he will be beaten with many stripes. Then come wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. He's still going to be beaten. Okay. I'm going to show you all this stuff next week. I'm just giving you heads up because ain't got a lot of time. God say, if you know what to do and you don't do it, you're going to get beaten with many stripes. But when you still do stuff and you didn't know it was wrong, right. you know what God said? He's still going to get you. Right. Now that's low down. <laughs> I mean, at least in the world I can go tell the cop, I didn't see the light. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know there was a stop sign. You see all them bushes over there? That stopped me from seeing that. <laughs> at least I got a chance. But with the righteous judge, Lord, I didn't know it was wrong to do that. I sent you my Bible. I sent you preachers. I sent you others to tell you. Oh, well, but let me keep going. I'm going to finish up in just a minute, so don't, don't worry. It's going to be over with in a minute. You ain't got, it's like taking one of them vaccinations. It's gonna be, 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 be. I'm still giving you stuff, but don't worry. I got just a few more sticks to go, and that's going to be it. Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. I've lost a lot of time that I could have been serving God and I've missed it. You see, I don't know how God is going to judge us. I really don't. Don't nobody really know. But what he tells us in, in Corinthians, he tells us in the third chapter, he says, look here. Every man's work is going to be tested. Every Christian's work is going to be tested. And it's going to be tested by fire. If you got something left, you're going to get a reward for it. If you ain't, you're going to suffer a loss. But he says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Here's what I, I don't want to. I do everything I can because as we get older and if we keep living, we're going to get older. 
And one of the worst things I think that could ever happen for anybody's life is when they look back over and say, I should have. Don't let your life be like that. Love the Lord with all your heart. Give him all the best you can right now. And know this, he will judge all your works. And people that don't study the Bible, they believe it ain't no judgment for us. They feel like they can do anything they want because they say that there are no consequences to their actions. I want to tell you something. Everybody's like that. You don't read the Bible. You haven't read the whole thing. And you let folk and preachers sometimes lie to you because preachers lie. They lie in order to get money in their pockets in order to grow their churches. And you know better than me, I've run enough folk away so it ain't about trying to grow no church. I'm just trying to teach the word of God. And we have to remember that God is the judge. Many like to say that all of that was in the Old Testament and passed away, but they fail to recognize God don't change, even in the New Testament, and especially in the New Testament. Now watch this. I'm going to show you some of the things in the New Testament. I'll quit with this. I'm fixing to line up all these other scriptures here. James 5, 9. Check this out. Don't grumble against one another. A lot of folks can fail down right now. Grumbling is talking about people. Well, they ain't this, they ain't that, they, you know, this, that. Grumbling. Grumbling. He said, don't grumble. What's the other part? Lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. James is talking to Christians. Peter is talking to Christians in the fourth chapter, 1 Peter 5. He says, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. God's going to judge every human being, my brothers and sisters. We need to be aware of that fact that there is a judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die. All of us are going to die, and then after that come a judgment. If we all die, we all get judged. 2 Timothy 4.8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. The righteous judge. Our God is a judge. He's going to judge what you are doing the rest of this day. What you going to do with it? I'm looking forward. This is one thing. I know I'm doing what God wants me to do right here. Hallelujah. I have a moment to store up for myself treasures in heaven. What are you going to do with the rest of your day? Right now you're hearing the word. Can you walk within this truth with a recognition of knowing that God's going to hold me account for what happens on the rest of this day? Because today I've learned he's going to judge my actions. And maybe you don't know everything I'm saying. You don't hear it all yet. But believe me, I'm not lying to you. He goes on to this point. He says this, and this is what I want to say about this. Finally, there is laid up for me. The crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all, also to all who have loved his appearing. Who have loved his appearing. Acts 10, 40. We're still in the New Testament. Him God raised up. Now who is the him? Now we fix to know who's going to be the judge. You say, uh-uh, God don't judge us. Let me tell you who's about to judge you. You love Jesus? Guess what Jesus is fixing to do when you dead and come back up? God raised him up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. This very same Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, is going to judge how much you love him according to the works you have done for him. Don't say you love him and not do it. What do you say do? How can you call him Lord and not obey him? There are Christians that are doing that. There are Christians that have been deceived by, by the cunning craftiness of men in order to believe what they ought not to believe. That's why he said, study to show yourself approved. That's why I'm giving you scriptures so that you can understand. I'm not just giving you one scripture telling you what that means. I'm giving you the whole truth. And so he says, Jesus is going to be the judge of the living and, and the dead. 
And then he says in verse 43, good, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. So it's not the dirty work that you did, Christian, that you're going to get punished for. That's not, you're not going to be raised up for punishment. You're going to be raised up for appreciation. But when you've done something that's wrong that the unrighteous would be punished for, you won't be punished for it in the sense of a punishment. You just ain't going to get no blessing for that time you wasted at the club last night. You hear what I'm saying? You won't get no blessing for the time that you were drunk, the time that you were high, the time that you were cussing out that sister because she made you mad. You won't get a blessing for that. But if you don't know Jesus, and you got to be very careful because a lot of times some of you think you know Jesus and you ain't got Jesus because your works show you ain't got no fruit to bear. You ain't bearing no fruit, which obviously means you don't have him in you that produces fruit. Okay, I better explain that to make it a little simple. There are a lot of people who are in church today, who are not producing fruit, and the reason they don't produce fruit is because they're not attached to the vine. He says, by their fruit, you will know them. So those of you that are not producing fruit, well, my heart is right, but is your heart attached to the one that causes you to produce fruit? If ain't no fruit coming out from you, you must not be attached to the vine. Because everything that's in him produces fruit. That's another message, but I'm okay. Did you hear what I said? If you're really in Christ, you're going to produce something. What have you got to show for this past week for your saying you know the Lord and you love the Lord? Somebody get saved in your life? I don't know. Do you bring somebody to church? I don't know. Well, it's not every week we're going to get folks saved. It's not every, not every day we're going to be able to witness to somebody. Or is that true? Do we not always have an opportunity in season and out of season to be a witness for Jesus? And you know what? If you're not witnessing on your job, you sure not need to be witnessing up in the church. Wouldn't you think? I mean, didn't he say store for yourself treasures in heaven? What you storing up for? Because remember, you're going to be judged. That's the thing I don't like about it. I can go home and sit up and play on the piano, get my instruments, and have fun. But am I doing anything for the glory of God? You can go play your spades and, and, and uh, what's that, a bid wish? You can go do that. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, put a few pennies on the side if you want to. But know this. Let me end up on, uh, uh, let's see, I need to end up on a couple of scriptures here. Doop, 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 doop. Okay. Uh, Acts 17, 31. All right. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. That's Jesus going to judge the whole world. He has given assurance of this day by raising him from the dead. That's Jesus. Romans 2.16, in the day when God will judge the secrets, uh, uh, ain't that terrible? Any of y'all got secrets out there you don't want nobody to know nothing about? I'm going to ask you one more time. Y'all got secrets you don't want nobody to know nothing about? You got secrets that you don't want nobody to know nothing about? You know what? If you got secrets that you don't want God to know about, you don't want him to hold account. You know what you need to do? You need to confess it to him right now. You need to say, Lord, I thought I had a secret. But you say you're going to judge the secrets of man and you're going to judge the secrets by Jesus Christ. I want to be with you. So I'm going to do what you've given me as my get out of jail or get out of hell free card. I'm going to confess my secret to you. See, that's sometimes all you got to do because Jesus has come and paid the price. All you got to do is take that secret you've been holding on to, give it to Jesus, and let Jesus pay the price. He's already paid the price, and you ain't got to worry about it no more. Now, don't go making no more secrets, though. You hear what I'm saying? And then if you do... 
Go back to Almighty God and say, Lord, I done made another secret. <laughs> and I must confess it. Because if we confess our sins, he is righteous to forgive us of all our sins. All right. Uh, final. John 5. For the Father judges no one. Who is going to be the one that's going to be the judge? I'm going to tell you it's Jesus. And this is the final word I'm ending up on this. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That's Jesus, the one we love, the one that has saved us. He has saved us to judge us, but we're going to understand what for. He says that he should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Who does, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Verse 27. And has given him authority to execute judgment also. That's Jesus. Salvation comes in his name, but judgment comes by him also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. A judgment's coming, y'all. So when that judgment comes, it's appointed unto man once to die. For those of us that have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're going to be brought up and brought up to a resurrection of life. Meaning we shall have eternal life. And guess what? It'll be with the Father. Because we've accepted Jesus to say, I want to be in your presence. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Those who have not accepted Jesus will be lifted up after their death to have a resurrection of condemnation. But ours will be a resurrection of appreciation. No condemnation is in those who are in Christ Jesus, but there will be appreciation. Next week, I will talk about the judgment in which you will receive rewards according to the works you have done. And those who are without Christ will receive condemnation. You will receive appreciation if truly your heart is reflected by the works that you do. Check this out, folks. Be in church all you want. But if there's no work, no work bringing glory to God, there will be no works for you to get appreciation from God for. You must do the works that bring glory to God so that God can then give you the rewards that you have worked on the earth to store up for heaven. No works, no glory. No works, no reward, no works, no appreciation as Christians. But be very careful. If there are no works, it can be an indication that there is no salvation. To thine own self be true. If you are not producing fruit, you may not be connected to the vine. The ease at which you can push away serving the king may mean that you're not in the king's way. You're not doing what the king would have you to do. If you ain't doing it, maybe he doesn't have your heart.